right, we're at time. All right, we'll start up. Uh, we're going to talk about polka yokes, and this is the first place where we can avoid mistakes is actually by correct uh, by pronouncing it correctly. Uh, Right before a talk years ago, I said uh, someone had corrected me incorrectly, and they told me right before I went into the talk, you say it, uh, uh, hokey yoke, and so I went in the whole talk and I said it wrong, <laughs> which is just the greatest irony. But so poka yoke, um, and uh, there's me on Twitter, and fnconf17 is our handle, and we're gonna jump on into the content. So poka yoke. Term from Japanese manufacturing that means mistake proofing. So this is a picture I took in Nashville. Uh, this is we're going to look at a few examples just in the wild. So this is like Poke Yoke Go or something, where you can spot these things out in the wild. These uh, these mistake proofing devices. And so here's one where we, if you were to drive down into this parking garage in a big van or uh, or something where you had uh, a vehicle that was taller than seven feet. You would smash in and you'd get trapped under there and you know, everyone would be honking at you and be horrible. So instead you put this bar, seven feet, you bump in the bar and you know not to drive in. So you take something that could have been a tragedy and you just bump into the thing and someone backs away. So you keep something really awful from happening through a simple device. All right, and um, we have another example here of just a manhole cover. So what's the poco yoke here? Does anyone have an idea? Right, right on. That's exactly it. So generally, you pick this manhole cover up, and it, you don't have to position it right. They're heavy, and you don't have to. You can drop it any direction, and it's going to fit right down in there. And two, it's not going to fall down the hole, and it's gonna, you know they're heavy. You don't want to have to drag one back up, and so that that would be irritating. So it's round. It has uh, constant uh, same di uh, diameter all the way around. Okay. And so we have round, and we also have this funny thing here. This is a Rolu triangle. And manhole cover that also has constant diameter. So the roll of the triangle, no matter which way you look, go around it, it's always the constant diameter. So you could put this thing up on any side, and it wouldn't fall down into the hole either, which is interesting. So this exists in San Francisco. Does anyone have any idea why maybe we have the double pokey okay here? What is in San Francisco? Hill. So uh, the people taking off the manhole cover. Not just dropping it down in the hole, but if they let the thing roll, well, what's going to happen is it's going to roll a couple of, and then it's going to fall over. This one on the left would go down and kill a hundred people at the bottom of the hill. And so you keep a silly mistake from becoming a tragedy. And so I want you to start looking for these things in the wild. And I want you to look for them in software. And ideally, it'd be great if you could start building these. And this could become your new sport. And so. This has been a support of mine for, for a decade or so, where I've been trying to build these things, trying to find these things, and all my API designs fall into this idea of mistake proofing. And so it's a, it's a good karma thing, because you, you know you're making the world a little bit safer, and, and you're removing a little bit of tragedy. So uh, the characters behind this term, uh, Shingo, uh, Shigeo Shingo and Taichi Ono were at uh, Toyota, and here are the books. So is the father of the Toyota production system. Really interesting book here on the left. And then uh, uh, Shigeo Shingo is behind zero quality control, and uh, his name is tied closest with Pokeyokes. And then the book in the middle, this thing is really interesting. It's 240 examples that were pulled from different factories of these Pokeyokes that were uh, deployed. Okay, so let's start off by asking this question Are errors unavoidable? And so there's one view that would say, yeah, unavoidable, people make mistakes, blame, 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 uh, uh, people do things, just blame them, and then uh, we'll detect the mistakes in our final expression, and then we'll, we'll just let the customers find the mistakes and let them yell at us and we'll give them a discount or just get a different customer. Okay, that is the most awful path. Everything about that is just wrong. Uh, the blame is wrong. Everything is wrong. And so let's move down to this other option. So. Let's assume that any mistake that people make can be reduced or eliminated, and we do that through training people and building systems based on prevention. These systems based on prevention, okay, okay. So this is, it's a concept based on respect. It's respect for the workers, it's respect for the people you're working with, just respect for humans here, because you're saying people, you're not a bad person because you made a mistake. 
everyone makes mistakes. And the, the, the real fault is, is when we put too much pressure on people and we have people pinned down and we say, you've got to act like a machine. People aren't machines. They're bad at the things that machines are good at. They're good at things that machines are bad at, at least for now. Maybe 30 years will be different. But, uh, so, um, so repetitive tasks, things where vigilance, memory are important. We want to have pokeyokes around this. We want to have people focusing on more important things like building pokeyokes. <laughs> okay? So the basic functions here are around prediction and detection. So recognizing that a defect is about to occur and then doing something about it. Shutting down, low control warning, or after a problem's already happened, detecting it and then shutting down flow control or warning. We can see this is a map going left to right here. So we have a process. If we have a prevention, Pokemon OK, we're going to basically keep that mistake from happening. So think about FP. Think about all the things that whenever you first picked up your first FP language, the things that you no longer had problems with. And so just kind of put those in your head right now and think about these prevention Pokemon OK that are there. And then our next stage is around detection. So we, there's a mistake that's already there. What do we do to keep that mistake from being turned into a defect? And so also think about your code here. Okay, a physical example, we have, so this would be in a plant. So we've got this, uh, this part, this piece of steel, has this shape, has this hole in the bottom left, and we know we want to drill a hole in the top right. Okay, so we drill it, it's correct, everything's met. Okay, what happens if the part comes flipped upside down? So this thing, it looks the same other than the hole there. Well, if we do this, we've just created a defect. And so this is a real common model you'll see in the literature around Pokoyokes. And so we have, then we can create a jig. We can create this shape that when a correct part lays on top of it, it will fit on top of it and nest on the little, uh, the little bubble that comes in. And then we can create our correct part. Okay? So when it comes in backwards, it's going to fall down and it won't actually be able to seat. And so that would probably keep the from activating or if the operator, you know, so it depends on how automated you want to get. They can be very simple. But these are obviously things, your, your head's probably already turning now about things in your code that behave like this. So we think pipe systems, we think, you know, uh, pattern matching, you know, so. Um, but one big thing, I think, in FP, this is definitely a thing in, in uh, uh, lean manufacturing, but valuing mistake proofing over diligence. And I think that that is something that we get right in the FP communities, that you hear people off in the OO spaces um, talking craftsmanship. And I always give the shivers when I hear people talking about craftsmanship, because I think what they're, there's a blame thing that happens. And it's like, you're not good enough. You didn't work hard enough. And so it's going to be a slob. But the idea of putting everyone to the standard when a computer can catch you, when a device catch the mistake better than a human can, you're getting foolish. And so, so there are people that argue that, but I think are just absolutely dead wrong. And so, uh, here's a, uh, a blank here. You can see this is a form that you would uh, define new pokoyokes here. We see the before improvement, after improvement. In that book, if you go grab it, there are 240 things dropped in here with the little pictures of the before and after. <laughs> so, um, so uh, Inside of the book, there are all these funny things of where they're defining uh, the best pokeyokes and guide pins. I think I got like OK tag inside of Elixir. When you call into something, you get your OK and then your values. That's what seems to me like a guide pin. These uh, error detections, alarm, limit switches, counters, checklists. I start thinking about currying. I think about uh, a tuple that's the wrong shape. It doesn't have enough elements in it. I think, you know, all these things start messing over and you can start seeing how these checklists, how these counters, these different limits start coming in and, and, um, and work. Um, and at the top here, hints on uh, identify items with their characteristics, weight, dimension, shape. This is just straight up types of stuff. It's about, you know, does this shape fit this, uh, uh, this slot? Um, then we have uh, detect deviations from procedures and committed processes, and detect deviations from values via detection devices. And so here's one. Is anyone, have you even heard of uh, Wombat, OAM, uh, Erlang Solutions? It's uh, the monitoring tool. So th that's what I think of when I think about this bottom one, is detecting deviations. But uh, we'll move up, uh, a bit on into the diagrams here. Uh, there's this one. It's a little small, so I'm going to zoom in. And here we see this uh, list of human errors and causes.
causes of defects, and there's this causal chain. And the thing about this is I would be really careful about causal chains. Uh, there's a real problem of hindsight bias. Like, when a problem happens, it's pretty easy to find the problem that happened and blame someone and say, oh, knucklehead did it again, instead of actually identifying this process that's behind it or the three steps away. And some things, especially in software, are very complex, and it's not as simple as it seems. Hindsight bias makes it seem simpler than it really is. But in this chain, so for simple things like that shape fitting on there, that's where this applies. Uh, when we're looking at programming in the small, we're looking at catching these things in the small. Uh, the charts like this really help. And so the literature, you, you kind of get a sense of what's here. We can see that these uh, uh, inadvertent errors, so this is like, it's sort of goof. You know, it's like I didn't really realize I even made the mistake. That's the, the, the big chain of most of those there. And so uh, that's what our Pocoyokes are going to try to help us with. So with mistakes, let's look at another definition. Does anyone have this book? Okay, this is excellent. I, I, everyone else needs to raise your hand next time you get asked that question. Uh, because this is a, a brilliant book. Uh, it's about design. And design in that sense of ergonomics and Pocoyokes. It just fits right in with this whole model. But that most accidents are attributed to human error, but in almost all cases, human error was the direct result of poor design. And so rather than blaming the person, figure out the process, aim it there. It's the process, make these go away. And we can actually save some lives here. Uh, slips and mistakes are two different kinds here. So a mistake is intentional. I meant to do that, it just turns out I was doing the wrong thing. And a slip was I was trying to do the right thing and I just I just goofed up, you know. And so we have both of those in code and we need to think about the kinds of things that would help our consumers of our API, what will keep us when we're our own consumer in our code. Like we won't be surprised by our own code uh, later on. And so we're starting to think about I really like it when empathy starts coming into mind in the context of FP because it's a really it's a perfect place for it. Like people on the outside don't really think of us as being empathetic, but we are. We we don't want people to have to go through the horrors that they go through in, a, in OO and in imperative code. And so that's why we're here. So let's look a bit about mistakes in software development. Okay, so we got Wikipedia talking about bugs here. We've seen bugs, but here's what it's going to boil down to a lot. We're going to talk about compile time errors, runtime errors, logic errors, design errors. So these design errors are really tricky because we coded it to the design, but the design was incomplete. And this is where a lot of bugs show up. And so this is tricky. Like, and so we, we start thinking about different life cycles and spans where these can pop up. So this is our battle, and the first tool uh, against these things is our friend immutability. So off in FP land, this is serious. You know, we, we have immutability. And I want everyone to sort of think for just a second about this idea of, of immutability, like a thought experiment. So what if you couldn't steal? Like if it, not just that it was illegal to steal, but really, really illegal to steal, and you'll go to jail for a long time. Uh, but what if it was just physically impossible for it to happen? No one could. So you would change a lot about the way you live. I mean, you wouldn't. You just leave your laptop wherever you go to the restroom. You wouldn't be dragging your laptop into a dirty bathroom, and you all the you know so much had changed there. You wouldn't uh, have to lock your house. You wouldn't ever lock your keys in your car because you wouldn't have locks. There wouldn't be locksmiths. You wouldn't have any of these problems. You go to the park. You could leave your kid on the bench while you went off and did something because no one's going to steal your kid. Everything you, your whole life would be better in a lot of ways if this was impossible. And this is what we get in FP. We have constraints. There are guarantees in FP that other er, other stacks, other languages, they just they're like, eh, you know, we'll try to be good. We'll recommend you do this. FP, you can't avoid it. It's guaranteed, and the tools can count on this. They can live the life of someone in the place where there is no such thing as stealing. Think about threading. Think about <laughs> all of the things that com tools can take advantage of. Okay, so let's uh, let's look about what you learn in your first computer science class. So, what would this be called? In increment, right? So it's increment. And what would this be called in high school math class, or your when you're like a teenager, your math class? What's this? 
this is, you, yeah, you repeat your math, <laughs> you repeat your class, because you just failed, you know, knucklehead. And so it's funny that we, our kids, and they're 16, know a lot more than what they learn in college here, because the idea of x equal x plus 1 is just broken. And so let's look at immutability here in, in F sharp. So we say let x equal 5, there, say x equal x plus 1, and F sharp agrees with your math teacher. It says, uh, no, that's actually false. That's a false statement. And if we get really nasty about it, we say, no, we're going to force this assignment to happen. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pen 7 here to x. It's going to say, this value is not mutable. And so it's not going to let us do it. Well, except for it sort of would let us do it if we were to put the mutable keyword on this. And this is this place where F sharp, there's, it's almost there, but in the space in it's in, it's in the .NET framework, and it couldn't be really, really good. And it couldn't turn this idea, it will, will not allow mutation ever, ever, ever. So that was a compromise there. And as a result of that, F sharp gets to, uh, doesn't get to ride on the same bus that you ride on if you're an Elixir or Haskell or other places. There, there are things that it can't do for you that we get over on Elixir, that you get in Haskell, you get in Idris, and so on. And so that's a shame. But it does keep you from getting a lot of bugs. There are lots of protections it gives you, but you know, you, you, you paid the cost of it, and you don't get quite as much reward for it. And that's where these things about the absolutes are important. Constraints are super important. Talk about a constraint, purity. So purity, you know, so if we have A goes to B, so our output of our function is based entirely on the input of our function. We don't reach off into the environment. If, if we have a pure function, the output is solely based on our input. And when that's the case, and we can count on that, we can trust that, uh, we get all sorts of good. Uh, there's a place where that doesn't happen, and that's in OO land. And so OO land, uh, my favorite quote about OO is by Joe Armstrong. He says, with OO, the problem with it is you ask OO for a banana, but instead you get the gorilla holding the banana in the whole jungle. And so you got the entire environment there. You reach your arm in there, and you don't know if it's going to get torn off or what. Because so you've got this class, and you have this object, and you put your arm in that method, and you're wiggling around putting, putting a value in there. You don't know which constructor that object was created with. You don't know who's called what property setter. You don't know what method was called just before you or how many times. And you, you don't know any of this stuff. You don't know if there's another thread in their wiggling state. You have all these uncertain things, and so you have to code defensively, and you have all this stuff you're pinning around. You have to be a craftsman. And so you, you go into that mode of being a craftsman, because if you don't, you're going to crash. The thing you should do is get out of the minefield. You're in the wrong place whenever you have to worry about gorillas every time you call into a method. And so a place where you don't have to uh, think about gorillas is Elm. <laughs> so Elm has uh, a really beautiful setup here uh, where you have referential transparency, you have purity here. And so crazy, this builds up on top of, uh, it compiles to JavaScript. It's just, so if you can do that, <laughs> if, you can, if you can build something that's clean and pure and compile it to this, then anything's possible. So uh, you know, whatever they tell you at school, anything's possible. So um, here uh, we have Mario, and we see our character here. Uh, he's hop, 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 and we're seeing the timeline of where he's hop, hop, hopped over time. So what do we do about time? So in this case, so every function, if you're referring to the clock, then that's, that's going to be non-determinate. It's always changing out there, right? But here, we're actually taking time as an input into every function. So if we hop, we have a hop and also a tick on the time. If we don't hop, we just have a tick on the time. If we walk left, we have a left and a tick on the time. And so time, time, time is moving. And so uh, let's, let's see this in action here. So Mario's walking, walking, walking. And we're going to go time travel debug backwards here. So we're going to go back to the beginning here. And we're going to start changing Mario's future here. We're going to change how high you jump. We're going to affect gravity here. And so then we're going to move through here and see how he plays through. And so this is absolutely beautiful. Like, how would you do something like this in an OO language uh, where you were mutating state? You couldn't, you just wouldn't have, you know, this just, it's this territory of these nice, this is why they can't have nice things. <laughs> and so we have nice things here. Uh, you know, the Elm folks, they can kick off this time travel debugger, and we're off and running. Uh, so if you like, uh, if you like this guy, uh, you'll probably also like this. 
So this is a line of business, a boring line of business, LABA, as Scott Vlashen would refer to it, um, a version of, of the previous. And so uh, if you go to Elmling, the perfect bug report, you can see uh, this out here. And it basically it lets you go through a to-do tracker. And every event is uh, being shown. And you can play back with it back and forth. You can see everything that happens. Because again, every function call, is the, uh, the inputs are the only thing that affected it. All right. OO. -O. So this is our danger with OO, is every time we do anything, sometime later, this, this thing's going to, we're going to get shot in the back by ourselves. And which is, uh, this is over and over the problem. It's a dangerous place. Even the people uh, associated with the name say it's a dangerous place. And this is a way I like to visualize uh, when you hear the term uh, JavaScript in a functional style, or C sharp in a functional style, or whatever in a functional style, that phrase just really tears me up. Because the, on the left, we have these three declarative things. They're hard constraints here. We have a plug in the US, a UK plug, and we have an India plug here lined up. And we have an OO plug over here. We have an imperative plug. <clears throat> and it's like, hey, we can do the same thing, guys. We're all Turing complete. And, uh, and so that's uh, we can all have the light bulb come on, is what they're saying. But they, they keep on missing the thing that the fact is, is we have constraints over on the left. And on the right, you're going to shock yourself. <laughs> and so you're going to go to the hospital. And you're going to send someone else to the hospital. It's this dangerous, dangerous environment. And so every once in a while, you'll have this, we became slightly more functional. We introduced lambdas or whatever. And so basically what they did is they hooked a ground wire up uh, with the alligator clip. And so <clears throat> just, it, just, it just tears me up. And so we need to shut that, that kind of talk down when we can. Uh, politely move them to the right way, but uh, but we're you know we're all in the we're all in the choir here. <laughs> okay, so uh, pipe forward. So we have this idea of functions, and we know that inputs go to outputs, and we can chain many inputs to outputs to inputs to outputs, and here we are. So pipe forward is used in a lot of languages. In Elixir, it takes the expression on the left and pipes uh, the thing uh, the output of the expression on the on the left in as the first implicit argument the expression on the right. And F sharp, Elm, and so on is going to do the same thing, other than it's going to be the implicit last argument to the expression on the right. <clears throat> OK? So here's a transformation. We're going to take drink your Ovaltine as our string. And we're going to try to transform that into taco, wrapped in tacos. And we're going to yell, drink your Ovaltine. And we're going to snake case things. We're going to put little snakes into the space. And we do this in the normal sort of style, and it's horrible, really. I mean, it's painful. It's, it, it's, I could actually, I, when I typed this, I had a bug in my code. <laughs> I, I missed my tacos. I had it in the wrong function with taking the tacos. And so this is the way that a lot of code is written. But then you move over, and you see what we get here. We have this mistake-proofing device right here. It is really hard to make the mistake whenever you drink your Ovaltine, snake, space, wrap in tacos, and yell. It's very clear, very obvious, and it's not inside out. Union types, algebraic data types, those types. So uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about pattern matching here. So we have C sharp or F sharp. Uh, we have our type, shape, circle, square, triangle, rectangle, and uh, you can describe a circle by a float, its radius, and so on. And we can then define uh, this get area function here that's going to take a shape. And we're going to match that shape. We're going to have this pattern match here. And if we hit circle, it's going to destructure that, uh, whatever came in, into a radius. And we'll be able to say pi times radius times radius, and so on to the other. OK? So that's good. That's clean. And what we have here is this shape. We just have four things it can be. And this is powerful, because this is, again, this, this thing that has a certain number of slots. If we add ellipse up here. <coughs> to our shape, we're going to get warnings by the tool. We have this pokey okay that just kicked in and it warned us. You're about to have runtime errors, tool. You know, you just added an ellipse, and you haven't updated all of your matches all over the place. <clears throat> and so this is, this is excellent. You know, we, we keep from having these, these disasters happen here. The tools are able to do this. <clears throat> Another thing they're able to help us with is here, if we do something really goofy, like say get area of null, well, it says shape does not have null as a proper value. Well, of course it doesn't, because null is ridiculous, right? And so uh, and F-sharp says make invalid states unrepresentable. And 
So this is that straight up thing of the Pokeo case. All I mean, each thing is just straight up like the jigs that, that, that we won't allow the operation to happen if, if we won't allow the defect to happen. Okay, let's take the same example and look at units of measure. So in the United States, we mess everything up in the entire world for everyone. And so here we have uh, what all sane countries have, the metric system with centimeters. Of course it's in centimeters. And then you've got everyone in the United States, of course it's inches. And, uh, and so here we come in, and so we're going to handle this. We're going to have a, a unit of measure here. We're going to add in. It's going to take a measure. Always going to take the measure. And now we go down in the bottom. We say get area rectangle of two centimeters and three centimeters, and we get six cubic or uh, square centimeters. That's nice. And if we say get area rectangle of two centimeters and three inches, we see the unit of measure centimeter does not match the unit of measure inch. And what we just saw fly by here is the Mars uh, polar orbiter, which turned out not to be an orbiter after all. It ended up being a, uh, a lander, a very fast lander, because they had a unit of measure problem, and it wasted years of work, millions of dollars, and who knows what good research that just went away because some American with inches or you know something along that was the problem, and so, but we have Pokeyokes here that would have kept that from happening. <clears throat> Dependent types. So now we're getting into some really uh, deep territory that I barely know anything about, but I know I'm interested in it. <laughs> I know. So this is Edwin Brady here, uh, the inventor of language Idris, and so he says, "What are types for? They're for checking a program has intended properties, guiding a programmer towards." A correct program and building expressive and generic libraries. This is what we're here for, right? This is this talk. This is Pokeyokes. It yells these things. And so Idris has this amazing thing called dependent types in it. And so dependent types lets us, so in a normal function, we might say, okay, this thing takes a list of integers, or it takes two lists of integers. Okay, that's good. We get type safety. We pass it in a list of strings. It's going to give us compile error, right? So, but here in Idris, we can say, we're going to take. Uh, a, a vector, so a list with a length of it, and we're going to guarantee that at compile time that we're going to put these guarantees on so that we can match on values. So we're going to have a compile time error if you call this this thing with a vector of six ints and a vector of five ints, because it knows it needs to add those two up, and, and so we can set these constraints on values. So values is type. So we see something like that in Erlang, where we do pattern matching on constants. We'll see an example of this a little bit later, but that's at runtime where you're getting these checks. This is a compile time, and it's spooky magic. And so this is my 2018 plan, is to actually learn this language, because it just yells Pokeyokes, and uh, so I'm grabbing, the, I have the book, I've already started it, and this is uh, my 2018 plan. All right, incorrect docs. So a lot of things incorrect in C Sharp, a lot of things incorrect in this example, but this is on MSDN, I think they've updated it now. It was on MSDN like a month ago. So we have this documentation here, E uh, equal O as employee. And so what this would be doing is it would be doing a, a cast. Basically it would be saying, oh, we're going to turn you into an employee, and if you can't be turned into, if you're not an employee, uh, E is going to be equal to null, which is really awful anyway. I mean, even if this was a good example, this would be a terrible example, because this is a horrible set of things that are happening here. But notice what we're doing here in this example saying var e equal o as employee, and then we're saying if o is equal to null. So it should be e equal to null. That's our bug here. And so what this would allow us to do is we could pass in a burglar class that happened to have a name object or a name property on it, and the burglar would come in there and say, okay, as burglar is an employee, e is going to be null, but o is not null. So it's going to fall down to the bottom, it's going to do a name compare, and it's going to say the burglar named Bob is the same as the employee named Bob. Let him on in. <laughs> and so that's terrible. Uh, so what can we do better? So over on the Elixir side, we have this idea here of, you know, inside of our code, our code comments, we put examples. That's nice, right? That's, you know, you show everyone how to use your code. What we have here is really a doc test. So if this is wrong, if this is not true, we br that's a failed unit test. And so we broke the build at this point. So if I, if I do a pull request and I break a noom count and I somehow say it's, you know, off by one or something, that build of Elixir will never go out the door. You can do this in your own code. It's not specific to the Elixir project, but in any of your Elixir code, you can have these uh, doc tests. In it. Very powerful, very nice. Cycle. C Sharp, we have, uh, here's some C Sharp code. This isn't the best C Sharp code, I admit. I'm sort of picking on them. 
but uh, they allow it, so uh, you know, we're going to pick on them. So here we have uh, class A depends on B, class A depends also on class B down here, and then uh, class B depends on class A, class B depends on class C, and then class C depends on A, and then class C depends back on B, I think, if I got that right. And uh, some, yes, I, something like that, I think it was. Okay, then over on F sharp, here's what we get. So we've got the same exact construct set up, but we get a compile error. It's going to say, nope. And it's going to say, nope. Notice the one at the bottom, there's no nope down there. It allows the, a, uh, the type C to depend on A and B. It doesn't allow B to depend on C, and it doesn't allow A to depend on either one of them. So what we have here is directional compilation. So you can only refer to things that are defined above you. This is a pokeyoke. This keeps cycles from happening. Okay, so you might think it's just a mistake. I, I thought it was a mistake the first time I bumped into F sharp and I saw this. I thought they just didn't get done with F sharp. <laughs> and so, but and, and, but then I saw this thing, and I was like, okay, this is this is me being a bonehead because this is intentional. So even on the project, so we have Big Zoo FS project. Notice these files aren't in alphabetical order. So in F sharp, our projects are defined in the order of dependency. So we can know that common utilities here doesn't depend on anything else in this project. And we can go down to the bottom line of project FS, and we can expect to see sub-main. Because it's depending on everything above it. And if we go into the elephant washer uh, uh, file here, we can be pretty sure that we can change it without breaking anything above it, but we might have to check and make sure that we're not breaking activity clues. That is powerful, and it's it's something I wish a lot of other languages has. But it's it's this it's this beautiful pokeyoke that I don't see in other places. But this is the culture and and FP. We see these interesting things, these things that keep bad things from happening. Concurrency, lots of bad things happen here. There's an inverse relationship between developer seniority eagerness to take on threading. We have a different story. Again, we have these tools that, that create these protections, these, these things to keep us safe. And the Erlang VM is full of these things. So here we have a group of processes. Each of these isolated processes are running. Uh, this is all within the context of Erlang VM, which is an operating system, really. It's not just language runtime. Uh, the Erlang VM is running, has these processes that, that we wrote, and they're all out there. They all have their mailboxes. And if they fail, they fail independently. They don't share memory. They don't do anything. They're just out there, isolated islands. The only thing they can do is they can send messages. And it all happens just through message passing. And it's all happening concurrently here. It's not happening in parallel. We're running one core here, right? But if we run multi-core, it's all happening in parallel. And it didn't change. Nothing changed because we have this isolation model here. The rules stay the same. And it's the same place to work. All this code is top to bottom sequential code. It's easy to think about, even though we have massive concurrency. So we have millions of processes running on a box. We have processes running on multiple boxes. We have supervision. We have links and monitors. We have all this communication between servers. And we don't have the same kind of problems that you have in the simplest thread pool problem in C Sharp or Java. It's, uh, it's, it's just remarkable. And again, it's these constraints that we have <coughs> based uh, on on our, on our choices that we put on ourselves. Error handling, try catch. So this is just the, the nuttiest idea to say, okay, so months from now, I'm gonna predict what weird thing led to this thing that I'm smart, I'm not smart enough now to actually guess what's gonna happen and code around it. But I'm gonna put this try catch block in here that'll probably figure everything out for me at the time. <laughs> and so it's like, you're, you're gonna send this agent into the future that's gonna look at this thing that you can't uh, keep in your head, and you're going to do this in a place where there's mutation, and there's threads, and you know all these problems we've been talking about in OO, and you imagine that's going to work. And, and of course it turns clean code into just a garbage heap. It looks awful. It's the, and once you do catch something, quite likely you've got a weird states then that keep on, and eventually the whole thing, this is the problem of why whenever time something goes wrong on the computer, you call the help desk and they say reboot your computer. It's this. And so you reboot your computer because it gets rid of all this trash uh, <coughs> of try catches, basically. So let's look at Elixir 
uh, it's error handling. Page left intentionally blank. <clears throat> so we don't do a lot of try catching in Elixir. Uh, uh, the idea is to let it crash, and you can do that because of supervision trees. Again, this device here that keeps us out of danger. So <clears throat> here we see at the, the side over here, we see this process here with these links over here. It's a supervisor, supervising these. And it's being supervised by here. So here's our root level supervisor, supervising tree. And so we have this message being sent over here, something about it's poison, and it kills our logic. We didn't handle it well. Uh, so then our supervisor basically just restarted us to a good state. And maybe that was a one-time message. Maybe that thing will keep on getting killed, and it'll stop getting restarted after uh, a strategy change. But this is much cleaner because all that code was just written like there was no concept of an error at all. Code the happy path. Not everyone is running on the uh, Erlang DM. And so there's a really nice pattern that Scott Vlashen uh, uh, has a talk on. This is a brilliant one to go off and, uh, and watch. Uh, you can F sharp for fun and profit, ROP. But this talk is, is just amazing. And so the idea here is you have a function uh, that you have two paths. You can either exit with a success uh, track, or you can, so there's railroad analogy. Like you can always split off. You can have a success track that you exit with, failure track, and you can link these things together, chunk, 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 and then you could have the thing goes through the whole path on the success path, or it was successful, successful, and then it falls down into the fail path. And this keeps us from having to have all these nasty try-catch uh, groups in there. So this talk, this is one to worth going in. I'm not going to go into much detail, but I'll show you how popular it is that it even does show up in the Elixir community. And, and so it's been brought over there. Even though we don't have try catches, we don't worry with that. There's still the cases of, of having to match on cases of different events happening. And so what we've done here is a built-in language feature that basically was built around this idea of the railroad-oriented programming. So with, so we here we have all of our happy cases here. Um, <clears throat> happy cases okay this one captures okay and then a user comes back that's inside of our scope then so we get to use that user we fall on fall on down and any one of these fails we're on the failure track which is down here and then we can match so this is just to handle validation and that sort of thing really nice pattern matching so we have this weird thing so we're in elixir so this is the examples can be in elixir and we're looking at this low level idea of binaries and bits so normally in a territory where we bring out the C compiler and probably create a seg fault, we're going to have a, uh, instead, we're going to have in this functional language with this declarative model here, we're going to strip into uh, these binary files and we're going to read this bitmap here, which is five pixels. So we have a, a super zoomed in version of this thing. We have a black pixel, a red pixel, a yellow pixel, blue, and white. Uh, and uh, it's a 24 bit, five by one pixel. Uh, <clears throat> so, so we're going to do a pattern match. We're going to say OK, and then we're going to capture a bin data. We stop a file read, red, green, blue file, and we captured that. So our bin data now is equal to this. Okay. We know a little bit about the bitmap format. The first thing we see here is the BM at the left. So that's we're making a uh, like a literal. We're saying that this first two bytes of this thing has to be BM. So we're going to go ahead and do this pattern match here, and we'll walk through it <coughs> to make uh, bit by bit. So our BM here, it matched that, obviously. So is that BM? Yep, that's it. <coughs> then we're going to throw away the next 64 bits because we just don't care what's there. It's header information that we are not interested in right now. But the next part we are interested in. So we're going to capture the next 32 bits, as a little Indian, to this variable called offset to pixel. This is going to tell us where our pixel data begins. So this is going to be after all the header data, right? Okay. So it's at 122 is what we see up at the top. Uh, 7A, so 122. <clears throat> then we're going to throw away the next 32 bits of data. We just don't care what that is. It means something to somebody. We don't care. And then we're going to do a uh, match off of width in the size 32-bit little Indian. And we can see here that it is 5, right? So five wide, and so we're going to do height, and see off this match, it's going to be one, right? So th 
those were what we expected, right? This next one is interesting. So what do we have here? It's 24 size 16 little Indian. We're doing a literal match against 20. This is our color depth. We're saying this file had better be a 24-bit color depth file, or we don't really know how to deal with it, so we're just going to fall out. <clears throat> okay? So we captured that. We threw away the rest of the binary. We didn't care about the pixels. Okay? But now we care about the pixels. Well, we're going to show basically what we captured here. We're offset 122, width 5, height 1. Okay? Now we're going to care about the pixels. What we did is we threw away our offset to pixels bytes, threw that to the I don't care variable, the underscore there, and then we said, Everything else, we're going to capture this variable called pixels, and we're going to take pixels and we're going to feed it 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits into this 24-bit so color depth here. And we're going to read through the pixels until we've exhausted this. We have this list comprehension here. We're going to exhaust all of our pixels, and we're going to project them over onto the right into our RGB. And one line, one screen of code <laughs> inside of a REPL, we've parse this binary structure and we didn't seg fall. And so this is the kind of power that we see in all, this could be, this is, needs to be ported into F-sharp. This needs to be in other FP languages. It's here in Erlang for whatever reason, Elixir for whatever reason, just because of the history. But it's really beautiful. <clears throat> so let me, um, I, I want you to just think about this problem here of, of like how, why Erlang? <laughs> Uh, why, do, why is this stack, why does it have nine nines of uptime and all these success cases whenever you could look at it and say, do you even have a type system Erlang? And Erlang would say, nope, but I have an operating system. And so instead, we have another formal set of constraints. And so the Erlang operating system, the Erlang VM, forces a lot of things that we can depend on in the same way that a type system might help another language. And so I'm going to blast through, uh, so this is an interesting document here, Why Did Computers Stop and What Can Be Done About It by Jim Gray. This is Tandem Computing. And so this influenced the design of Erlang here. And so this is worth looking at. This is a brilliant book. It's going to talk about complexity. It's going to talk about uh, what makes things fail, why uh, some hard things, uh, why, why we can solve some things with analytic reduction, why some things are better with stats, and why software usually falls in this category of organized complexity, which is hard. Okay, so a, a lot of it comes down into uh, these organizations, these hierarchical levels. So in, in Erlang, we might see something that looks dangerous. It's no type system when we're down at the little. But we have these constraints that build up, and this whole system and these hierarchies, they feed back and forth, and we end up with structure at a higher level that basically keeps everything all right. And so instead of being dangerous, it's delicious. You know, we, we go, and so we get this goodness out of there. So in a lot of ways, Erlang has this extra step at the right. So it plays in the space a lot of languages don't. Elixir plays in the space. Of it has this extra level of recovery. So the defect is happening. How do we keep the defect from turning into an outage? Okay. Now this is the part I really want to run into here. So property-based testing. So <clears throat> writing unit tests is a waste of time. And so this would start fights in some communities. And I'd love to see this fight. Because uh, John Hughes would, would kick their ass. And so, so John Hughes, um, uh, uh, papa of uh, Quick Check, property-based testing, one of the Haskell, uh, uh, the, the folks behind Haskell. So here we are inside of Elixir. Def module, we're going to go back with our color idea here, color namer. Name color, 000, zero, zero can be black. Name color, 255, 255 can be white. Name color, red, green, blue. If red is greater than green and red is greater than blue, it's going to be red. Same thing for green is greater than red, green greater than blue is going to be green. So we fall through, and anything else is obviously an impossible color. Like anything else is just ridiculous, right? Okay, so we go into IEX, we build this thing, we say color namer, namer color, red, ship it. So we're done, right? We're, we've got our product, we're going to have our launch. Well, okay, we're, we're more responsible than that. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring out property tests here. And built in into Elixir 1.6 is property-based testing. It's right in the box. It's right here. And so we're going to walk in, property, check all. So we have these generators here, red, green, blue. It's going to come up with our values to feed into this thing. We're going to run, we're going to create 10 or 100,000 unit tests here and try to just swarm this problem. So instead of writing one unit test around the edges, we're going to create 100,000 of them. So come in through here, run, run our property-based test. It found one really quickly. 
we hadn't thought about the case of red and blue both being there, so we have to have our purple. While we're at it, we'll probably also add yellow and cyan, and now we've exhausted all possibilities and everything should be perfect, right? It thinks about it a little bit longer, and it finds 250, 250, so we found gray. So we missed this other case here. Okay, we're gonna run again. Zero failures. So we have perfect code here, and John Hughes is down here doing his celebration dance, right? Right in the box in Elixir, these are again tools that you won't see in a lot of other stacks of other places. Okay, so we're at the end here. Value, mistake proofing over diligence. Think about this. You've got, on this side, you've got karma, where you're helping the world. On this side, you've got spaghetti, where you're not really helping anything. And take your sport, go off and do awesome things with it, and I'm glad that you all are in this room and I'm gonna be using your code. <laughs> so uh, we're out of time, and so throw questions at me on Twitter. Uh, I love to keep in touch, so, uh, and also uh, help yourself to the Google clusters even if you were too busy you know, listening to tweet or anything. And uh, if you want to keep in touch, uh, I will stay up cards up here. I'm going to get off the stage to the next person that can pop up here. Thank you all.